Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to this webinar from us at GRC Solutions. There might be a few people still uh, joining us a little bit later. I'm hoping everyone can hear me okay. Uh, if not, you have got the ability as part of the webinar to raise a hand and then also to ask a question. As we progress throughout this morning and we'll be on line for about an hour, feel free to ask questions at any point. So you can type in a question which I'll see on, on my screen uh, and I'll endeavor to answer those uh, as soon as we can. If there are any questions that uh, you want to answer, uh, to ask apologies separately, feel free to contact us afterwards. Uh, I will have details at the end of the presentation, but also our, our contact details are available on the website as well as on my LinkedIn profile. And we're happy to, to help out with any questions, queries, clarifications regarding today or generally the topic we're, we're presenting. We're looking today primarily at digital disruption with regards specifically to regulatory developments, what's been happening over the last, really the last sort of two or so years, what we're seeing changing, uh, and also really with that in mind, the speed at which things are and continue to develop. We can't cover everything today. There is a huge amount happening uh, generally with what's going on in this space. Um, we're trying to cover some of the key pointers and we're primarily looking at this from an Asia perspective. So for the Southeast Asian markets, so Singapore and Malaysia, Indonesia, as well as Hong Kong and elements of China, some elements today will touch on India as well as onto Australia. We will also reference other places that have been very important with regards to this. Uh, for example, um, the UK. This topic is very broad in the sense that we're looking at two key things, fintech and regtech. Fintech is something that people consider often to be very new, but in reality, it's been around for a very long period of time. We're really looking here at the idea of technology making financial services more efficient. That could mean one of many things. Uh, and as we'll see in a, a couple of slides time, this isn't something that's happened in the last three, five, ten years. It's been uh, around really since financial services started. The way we look at this presently is really from the point of view of often, but not always, startups trying to disrupt and, and make improvements and challenges to incumbent financial systems. So we look at that from the point of view of banking, which is where we look at fintech, insurance, so for example, insuretech, and of course, regulatory technology, so regtech amongst others. We will touch later again on the idea of this being not so much people trying to do things that would necessarily replace current systems, but those that often are designed to work alongside, improve and enhance currently available products, services, tools and technologies. Some of this data here is taken from a, a really good presentation and study done by uh, a group towards the end of last year. So Professor Ross Buckley, uh, as well as Professor Douglas Arna and Janos Barberis. And I think this is a really great overview of the idea and the, the sort of principle behind the fact that fintech isn't, isn't new. It's been around for a very long period of time. Uh, and our dates here go back to 1866 when we start looking really at the developed world, so what we look at as Western economies, with starting uh, banking structures. Now, of course, financial services extends way, way back past this point in time. You go back through insurance for the preceding few hundred years, but that really dates all the way back itself to the Roman Empire. And of course, in Europe, we had various financial structures across parts of Northern Europe uh, over the last few hundred years. As we moved on through periods of time such as the, the 1960s and up until really just pre the, the current or the finishing financial crisis, we look at FinTech 2.0 and looking at a real shift towards technology. And this is very recognizable for most of us. So for example, things like ATM machines, which we use on for most of us on a, a regular basis, things like online and mobile banking. So in the early 2000s, we had a bit of a surge in things like online banking, things becoming a bit easier and less reliant on the bricks and mortar. Following the, the 2008 financial crisis, we've seen a, another huge shift, I think, in terms of a development on both the idea of accessibility for products and services, streamlining it and making it more efficient for consumers, 
as well as the regulatory side. So how can we improve regulation of financial services? How can we try and prevent that type of situation happening happening again? But we see this typically with regulation that it has historically tended to be very pro, uh, very reactive. So we're often looking at changing regulation based on something that's happened in this case, the, the financial crisis. What's interesting to look at here is it's not just banks. It's also, we're looking at, of course, the startups. We're looking at telco firms. So for example, um, communications companies that are getting involved in helping people change and move money. And we'll look at a brief case study on that later. And this also is, is encroaching increasingly on the developing world. And we've seen examples of that in a very real sense with things such as M-Pesa in Africa, which has really been around for now over a decade. And they're being replicated in places like Myanmar. Looking at things like ATMs, electronic stock trading, you know, mainframes, e-commerce, these are examples of fintech. So this is a good idea of it not being new. At some point in time, of course, a checkbook was a brand new invention. You know, so that was some form of technology that helped people bank in a slightly different method to that they'd used in the past. Most of the developments we've seen, for example, the development of the ATM, were not designed to replace or remove an element of banking infrastructure. They were designed to enhance it. So these were used by banks. These were adopted by banks. These were adopted by customers of banks. And there wasn't a threat posed. These were used to enhance what services were offered. I don't necessarily agree with this quote at the bottom, but I think it's interesting. Fintech services are not simple enhancements to banking, but rather replacing banking services completely. I think it's widely agreed now that this actually isn't really the case. Uh, most fintech firms that we see are not trying to replace something as such. I think they recognize it's very difficult to do so. It's very, very difficult to dislodge an, an incumbent of serious size, whether they're a bank or another financial services provider or whether they're an insurance firm. Most fintechs recognize this and I think are trying to work proactively with the rest of the financial services sector to provide better products, better services to them as time goes by. It's worth noting here that the growth of fintech, and it's, this type of thing is hard to measure. It's hard to say um, one firm is bigger than another firm. We look at things like investment. Uh, of course, as time goes by, revenue will be an easier way potentially of seeing or potentially stock value, although that's not always the best indicator, of the size of growth of this market. Investment in fintech is is growing and it's growing at a huge rate. So going back to 2013, looking at around $4 billion to 2014, a triple to $12.2 billion. Now, in the first three quarters of 2016, Asia received nearly $10.5 billion of investment. Uh, and that was just within the first three quarters. So that's an absolutely huge amount. Uh, and this is from data which was released earlier this week. In terms of how that compares with other regions, uh, Asia last year, 4.2 billion for the entire year. So again, it's looking at getting towards a triple from one year to the next. Europe last year received around 2 billion of investments and the US around 4 billion. So it's quite clear to see here that Asia is far outstripping the growth in both Europe and the US. Looking at uh, where this came from a few years ago, 2008, global investment was around 930 million, so just under a billion dollars. So the growth in less than 10 years has been absolutely phenomenal and looks set largely to continue. Looking at traditional hubs, we've seen places like London taking the lead really from a fintech point of view, uh, as well as obviously the the US, so Silicon Valley, and now increasingly large parts of Asia growing in a, a quick rate to take in a lot more investment, so particularly places like China. I just received a question here, so I'm just gonna have a, a look. Uh, in terms of the question that's just been received here was, is the investment data for FinTech 3.0 or does it include FinTech 2.0? This is overall investment data. Um, this, this is from Accenture, so there were two sets of data. One set of data came out in around September last year and a further set came out in an article uh, yesterday. Um, so this is, this is sort of relatively recent data, hence it only including um, up to uh, the third quarter of last year. But this, this includes what we look at really as primarily 
the fintech 3.0 side so the the sort of newer products and players and we'll come to some examples of that specifically in a moment now one of the issues looking at things like investment and size is that every time we we get numbers they vary somewhat and if we look at this is a graph here a chart from a group called vb profiles and this came out uh, in september of last year and if we look here, this says that these companies, there's a thousand companies listed here, are worth 105 billion in funding. Now that's 10 times the amount that we just saw. So it's hard to get a perfect gauge on exactly how much money is going around. It makes it very hard to value companies without having a little bit more detail. And it makes it hard to know which companies are the biggest and which are doing the best. Uh, but what we do know is where that money is going. If we look at the, the picture here, and I, I don't expect you to uh, be able to see this in great detail, but the large block on the, the left-hand side is payments. Of these 1,000 companies, nearly a third of them are in the payment space. And that, that's not surprising. So we're looking at things here like online payments, mobile payments, uh, online wallets, uh, and some blockchain and invoicing as well. Financing as well is a, a very big section. So peer-to-peer -peer lending and direct lending equity crowdfunding. And these are very big areas we'll touch on both a little bit later because they've been proven to be a little bit problematic from a regulatory standpoint and both for investors and for, for companies. What we're seeing happening a bit more now is the infrastructure and enabling technologies which we see towards the bottom. So some of the APIs, which is becoming a huge area from a, a reg tech side, the business tools, data analytics and security, as well as compliance and scoring. And some of these really fit more into the regulatory technology section, and we'll touch upon that towards the end of, of today. This is from September last year, and this was from a Business Times report, which is a newspaper here in Singapore. And this really picked out Singapore and London in the race to be the, the top financial fintech hubs. And to outline what was said in this article, and this was from a report by Deloitte, they looked at a number of key areas, and this has been expanded on this week here in Singapore by EY. Now, EY have, have really looked at this at the moment, in their eyes, as a race primarily between China and the UK. And the reason they've said that is looking at a few key areas. So the ability and availability of talent, the ability and availability of capital, and also regulatory policy. Looking at this, some places, for example, a smaller jurisdiction like Singapore struggles on certain fronts, for example, talent. We simply don't have as many people of the right skill set here in Singapore as are available in London or available in China. Um, and, and that, to some extent, could perform a function of holding back the development. Now, Singapore, and we'll see this later, has a, a very good, very strong business-friendly environment and huge support for this area. And in terms of the revenue side, it's, it's massive. Now, of course, the same is true of other places. China is pushing this um, very, very heavily in terms of general fintech, but has also faced some serious regulatory problems over the last 12 months. The UK, of course, is also driving this area very hard, given changes to their political circumstance in the last 12 months. Singapore is a leading financial center, a serious contender for the global number one spot in fintech. Now, it was a leading global financial center before the last few years of the growth of fintech, but it's trying to harness that a bit more. Singapore, and Deloitte said this, has excellent government support, regulation, and access to expertise. So an international jurisdiction which has the ability to attract and retain talent. One of the key criteria here was the amount of funding that's been put aside. And Singapore announced in November of last year they were setting aside 225 million Singapore dollars to help develop fintech projects. So compared to other countries, they're putting in an enormous amount of, of monetary resource. In terms of a comparison, uh, Austrac announced last year in Australia that their annual funding for the year is around 70 million Australia dollars. Um, so we're looking at three times the amount in Singapore being put just into fintech projects. So it's a staggering sum. As time's gone by, we've seen this, and I mentioned it briefly earlier, that firms are seeing more advantages in moving themselves to enable banks rather than to supplant them. It sort of goes back to the idea of why try and reinvent the wheel. If we can actually do something that helps banks develop and we can work alongside them, then that's good for us, as well as being good for the financial firms that we can help support. 
all local institutions here and this has since grown in Singapore to be not just the banks but also uh, insurance firms for example Aviva uh, have partnered or launched their own fintech units or, or helped fintech startups so the, the sort of growth in this space is is breakneck uh, at times very hard to keep up with what does this mean in, in practice and how can we look at this from a a consumer perspective and, and what benefits might it yield uh, and one of the good or better examples we have is from uh, a group called lending club which is based in the us in terms of looking at the the raw numbers here ongoing expenses of a share of outstanding loan balance is about two percent for an organization like lending club and lending club has been around for well over 10 years and, and is listed a, a listed entity in the us now an equivalent for a conventional lender is five to seven percent just on the pure pure sort of numbers here you can see that lending club is able to offer better deals to borrowers and lenders on its platform half of the applications they get arrive outside normal business hours so these are typically small loans small loan applications uh, for people and they can keep costs down this isn't without fault and a little bit later we'll come back to some of the issues faced by particularly lending club but organizations that are also offering this type of product and service what does it mean in, in this region in Asia and for us it's important to think about things in a slightly different way because we have a different or we've had a different take on technology for many places so for example Myanmar for example Indonesia where we've got large amounts of the population who we we look at as being not financially included so they're not using PCs they're not using online banking methods they don't have access in some cases to traditional bricks and mortar in terms of banking and retail but of course they have they have money they have assets what can we do to help populations in these countries and this is where fintech is now starting to really push forward a better agenda for for local populations going back to the beginning of last year Myanmar had about one and a half thousand bank branches to give an idea of of what that means in in real size uh, this is a place that's a similar size to france and has a population of 51 million so it's a, it's a significant size of country and of people and that's not very many bank branches per person as of 2012 10 percent of the population owned a mobile phone as of 2016 this has grown to around 60 percent this obviously provides a good access point to contacting people as phone ownership has, has really risen to a huge extent. With the change in the political structure in the first half of last year, the government passed a law allowing non-banks to enter the e-money market. Looking at offering services to the unbanked, so providing a better element of financial inclusion to the population. An advisor an Australian economist advising the Myanmar administration said in terms of things you could do straight away that would improve people's lives this would float right to the very top and the reason being this enabled mobile money to be used in Myanmar so mobile money is Myanmar's best bet at swiftly linking its poor to safer more regulated financial services and that's from the UN Capital Development Fund a company called Wave Money was established this allows mobile money transfers and this works in a very similar way to the the m-pesa system that rolled out in parts of africa over a decade ago allowing people to transfer money on their phone from one place to another place so it's a tie up between a private bank and a local teleco operator so again we're seeing here that it's various elements of of industries it's not just banks or insurance firms or finance firms it's things like telecoms providers they quickly grew towards the end of last year to have a national network of over 4,000 establishments where you could deposit or withdraw cash. And the way this works is by going in and depositing your cash, getting a code which you can send to another person who can receive that money. Now in a place like Myanmar where it's historically been quite difficult and often dangerous to move money using physical means, this has opened up a huge wave of possibilities for people to move funds around. For example, people that don't live close to home. Uh, a quote here and this is from a lady who works as a cleaner in Myanmar uh, but not living near where her family live has said the advantage is it now takes very little time to transfer money so instead of saving wages and having them taken back physically and running the risk of them being stolen she can now send money using a code on a phone so this is really a good example of how we can use this type of technology uh, and open things up for elements of the population that might not have had access previously 
Now, lending club through last year had a number of problems, uh, some of them stemming from the type of loans they were giving to organizations, which they should not have been doing, uh, but also because of the type of people it was admitting to its system. And you can see this is from the Wall Street Journal of the middle of last year. Biggest problem are its borrowers and its charge off rates started going through the roof, essentially, through sort of 2013 to 2015. On the lower graded loans, the, the charge off rate, so people not able to pay off their loan amounts, increased by 38%. So it jumped up to nearly 6.5%. On their top graded loans, this was a, a much smaller jump, so it was around one and a half percent. As a comparison, percentage of loans written off by banks on credit card books in the same year had hit the lowest level for three decades. So the rate was at three percent. So this is quite a worrying trend that for some reason, a lot of people that are taking out loans and borrowing money via the Lending Club platform are not able to pay off their debt. Now, why might this be the case? If we look at the way that an organization like Lending Club allows people to take out money, there are some worrying statistics. And for example, we can see this again from the Wall Street Journal. Lending Club's verified actual income for loans dropped to 26.8%, down from a peak of 49% in 2013. Now, I know from personal experience and from a practical side, I would not be able to wander into a financial firm here in Singapore or any part of Asia or in the UK, for example, and get a loan without providing any verification of my income. But this is only happening, or was at the end of last year, for just over a quarter of people taking out loans on this platform. Without doing this type of data verification, it's hard to really assess the quality of background history for people so this again this to some extent and some people have looked at this and said um, it's reminiscent of the subprime type crisis you know so how are we able to justify giving loans to people if they can't provide any form of income evidence new firms were able to avoid many of the expensive regulations in banking now of course complying with regulations for most firms in financial services is not uh, an option um, but has got increasingly expensive the way this works for a lot of these organizations is they they technically don't take any investment monies from one customer or client and give it to someone else they pair up two people who lend the money to each other so that's what they describe as peer-to-peer -peer lending. This removes the idea of the capital buffers, so the capital adequacy ratios that banks would have to have. This provides a problem in itself in that these firms are not, not always, but they're not often particularly well uh, funded. Their underlying um, assets can be a bit thinner than you would expect from a typical financial institution, but also it allows them to skirt some of the typical regulations which have been put in place to safeguard individuals who would use those products and really from the point of view of um, regulatory side one of the key things we're looking at is safeguarding the market and safeguarding consumers of course it wasn't unexpected towards the end of last year when financial services firms as they look at this more carefully started to say that there should be some regulation we expect expansion of regulation to the financial technology side and this was from um, UBS the group CEO of the Swiss Bank at the Cybos summit I think the last quote is very interesting we welcome new entrants as it brings enhanced competition now whether you believe that uh, our man Sergio really likes enhanced competition or not his point does ring true if you're performing similar functions as the banks then you have to join the party now a lot of fintech firms say they're performing different functions, therefore they don't need to be regulated. I think what we've seen on the ground and anecdotally over the last, particularly the last six months, but probably the last 12, is the more established, the sort of stronger, more credible fintech firms are actually open and to some extent happy with the idea of regulation from the point of view it gives them credibility as a business. And we'll see in a minute a quote from an Australian business where they, they're, they're asking to be regulated. That would actually help them from a business perspective. That's quite an interesting change. We mentioned earlier problems in places like China, and we've seen this in a very real sense through last year. And this is a story from September. And this is this is actually what happened. So there's been a couple of very high profile cases in China, particularly around peer-to-peer -peer lending of companies going under. And 
You can see the story here. Peer-to-peer -peer lending companies have been raided and executives have been taken on prison tours. Now, I don't expect this to happen in most countries, but this is a, a good example of quite a, an extreme way of looking at this. So taking executives from firms round to the prison to show them what they might face should they be doing things they shouldn't be doing. In Changning, police released a statement about this, so they carried out a specific raid and they arrested five people. This was focused on two specific platforms, so Jin Lu Fund and Dang Tian Wells, Wealth. Uh, and the idea here was that they were pooling and taking in revenue from customers without having operational certificates that they needed. Having a, a relatively open regulatory environment has allowed all sorts of entrants to enter the market. So the barrier to entry historically has been quite low. When we look at things like peer-to-peer -peer lending or equity crowdsourcing, it's only in the last two years, most regulators have started releasing guidelines about this and started regulating people. So the same is true in Malaysia, where guidelines for equity crowdsourcing came out towards the end of 2015. And we've had six firms approved to conduct that type of business uh, through the end of last year. Some firms have been accused of being Ponzi schemes, uh, the most famous of which in China was Edsu Bao, and this was an enormous scheme um, described by an investor as nothing but a Ponzi scheme and lost $7.6 billion. 95% of the product was fake, so this was taking in money from one investor and just giving it back to another. There was no real investment at all. Um, and this is, again, quite troubling. So when we're losing, we're looking at losing potentially tens of billions of dollars on these platforms. This is something we have to start worrying about from an investment perspective. Towards the end of last year, there was a report which looked at peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending platforms and, and looked at nearly a thousand of 3,000, so it was just over 800, being problematic. So these are organizations that are not really providing the service they're meant to provide, uh, haven't got the right approvals and operational certificates, uh, and are not providing uh, good value for people and actually are quite dangerous in many cases. The Blue Book of Internet Finance last year found just over a thousand, so 1,263 of the P2P platforms on the mainland at the end of 2015 were problematic. Cases of fraud or firms going out of business. Uh, that's a lot. That's a huge, huge amount of firms. If you recall back to the uh, the picture we had at the beginning of, of the session, we had about a thousand firms listed globally. So to have more than that amount that are problematic in just one country is a significant problem. This included 896 peer-to-peer -peer platforms got into problems in 2015. Over half of those involved in fraud. So looking at taking advantage of loopholes in regulations. That's an example of what this means in practice. This is a picture from this week. And this is a, a company that launched in China, uh, Dian Rong, another peer-to-peer -peer lender. And when they launched, and they launched uh, in the second half of last year, their advertising slogan was, honestly, we won't won't run away. Um, as you can see from this tweet, not particularly confidence inspiring. You know, so advertising your business as one that might just be here, uh, probably not the way we want these things to be happening when we're looking at consumer-based financial services. Uh, and you can see at the bottom in red, they've got the letters P2P. Uh, and this is quite worrying that we're, we're letting people work in business like this. We wouldn't expect this to happen from a traditional financial services firm. I wouldn't go and take a mortgage, for example, with a bank on the basis that they're not going to run away. That wouldn't be a good idea for me as a, as a member of society. And it's not something we would expect to happen from a, a compliance or regulatory perspective either. This obviously has called for a response. And what we've seen is, I think, a divergence of opinions. On, on one side, regulators are looking at this very actively and have regulated some of these types of products and looking at others and are rolling out different systems different services and techniques, uh, but also we've seen the industry response where we've had people saying, we want to be regulated, it would help us if this was the case. This is actually from July of 2015. The founder of Money Place, our biggest fear is a major failure by a P2P lender or a company claiming to be one that causes ASIC or another agency to come in and say, we're shutting this down. So this is an Australian scenario. So ASIC here, obviously the, one of the Australian regulators, uh, this guy's point is we're doing business properly. 
we're doing things by the book. We want to be doing things by the book and seem to be doing so. If other firms cause major problems, that's bad news for us. In a tougher fundraising environment, the go-it-alone strategy is difficult for many startups, can be costly for traditional financial services firms. We're starting to see more of a two-way dialogue. And what this means is we're seeing what we would look at as more traditional industry, financial services firms and uh, companies, helping those newer startups. So making sure they're working in accordance with specific regulations they should be working in accordance with, helping them with regards to funding. So we've seen lots of cases of organizations setting up divisions that uh, help fund fintech startups. So Goldman Sachs do this, uh, JP Morgan do this, and some of them work together on projects. For example, the Symphony Project in the US. We've seen the same with some of the blockchain technology with the R3 group. Lots has happened in the last couple of years, and really, we look back to probably the, the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK, um, which is the sort of newer regulator following the, the change from the FSA, launching what they called Project Innovation and their Innovation Hub and Advice Unit in November of 2014. This was a precursor. The FCA started looking at this and they started soliciting feedback and, and industry ideas and, and they followed this up with both FinTech Open Days and at the end of last year, RegTech Open Day, where they're running what we used to call things like hackathons, events for organizations to get together and test out ideas and showcase what they can do. Towards the end of 2015, both MAS and Bank Nagara looked at other things. So MAS launched a, a FinTech and Innovation Group and they brought in some quite senior individuals to run that, and that's been, been going on ever since, as well as Bank Nagara Malaysia launching a regulatory framework to facilitate equity crowdfunding. And through last year, they had six registered companies doing so. Securities Commission also have their affinity at SC, and in November of last year, we had the FCA announcing their plans for the regulatory sandbox, and they framed this as a global first. And we'll come back to sandboxes later because it's certainly taken off as, uh, as a, a topic ever since. The FCA also announced a call for input on RegTech, and this was one of the first times we saw um, bigger news about RegTech, and, and this also was uh, linked to or followed by IIF, so the Institute for International Finance, producing a very detailed white paper on RegTech and its implications for financial services. December of 2015, the China Banking Regulatory Com Commission launched initiatives for online lending rules and also regulations for non-bank providers for online payment services, which came into effect in the middle of last year. 2016 saw what I would describe as an absolute uh, sort of burst of activity with regards to both FinTech and RegTech. And we're now seeing the same happen for InsureTech. So ASIC releasing information on marketplace lending, so P2P products early last year. Uh, Securities Commission, which is Malaysia, announced some information that was similar and took effect last uh, May last year. We saw MAS release a consultation paper on the regulatory sandbox on June the 6th. We saw ASIC release a consultation paper on exactly the same thing two days later. So we started seeing a real ramp up in speed of things happening. April of last year, or so that should be 2016, RBI, which is the Reserve Bank of India, released a consultation paper on peer-to-peer -peer lending as well. This year, or sorry, 2016, continued with uh, very busy announcements. So MAS releasing regulations for securities crowdfunding and FCA announcing a call for input on something similar on the crowdfunding rules. The end of last year, so from sort of August time, was uh, absolute mayhem with regards to fintech and regtech. Bank of Thailand getting on the action, announcing regulations to go into effect soon. MAS launching their innovation lab, which they've called the Looking Glass uh, from Alice in Wonderland. And China, the Banking Regulatory Commission, publishing peer-to-peer -peer lending rules. In October, Indone Indonesia announced it was launching a regulatory sandbox and a fintech office. Hong Kong in September announced their, them releasing a regulatory sandbox or, or bringing one out as well. Bank Nagara Malaysia on 21st of September, and they've done a couple of things and they've held events as well, announced a concept paper for fintech, which the idea will be that that becomes the guideline for financial institutions. In November, the Securities Commission of Malaysia had an event, SC by SC Digital Finance Conference. And those two things were sort of closely linked, although they're different regulators, and were part of a very broad push in Malaysia to 
increase looking at fintech and fintech cooperation. In November, the Fintech Association of Malaysia was also formed, uh, and we'll come back and touch on that a little bit later. Bank Negara Malaysia also released guidelines for their regulatory sandbox, as did Singapore in November. And there's some variation there in, in what they've done, and we'll touch on that in a moment. MAS signed cooperation agreements with South Korea and the government of Andhra Pradesh. And we also had the FinTech Festival in Singapore. Now, the FinTech Festival in Singapore was in mid-November. The week before, Hong Kong held a FinTech week as well. And there, there was a divergence of opinion, depending on who you are and where you're from, as to which was a better event. Um, but they were both very significant in terms of what they offered for the market and the fact that they were quite close together. The Hong Kong Monetary Authority and the FCA signed a cooperation agreement on FinTech in December. And in the last couple of weeks, OJK, the Indonesian regulator has issued regulations on peer-to-peer -peer lending. So you can see the, the volume of, and this is a snapshot. I mean, there's, there's an awful lot that's been going on, but the volume of things happening around this area and the growth in regulation. So we can see a, a real increase in what regulators are doing has really started picking up pace. I don't think will change too much in the near future. We've now seen companies so for example Fundnel here in Singapore an equity crowdfunding firm getting a provisional CMS license so a capital markets service license and what's interesting here is this helps the company they say this helps them this makes it possible to commit to offering quality private investments with due compliance to business conduct rules that seek to safeguard investors' interests, our mission lies in connecting investors to promising private investments in an efficient, effective, and open manner. Having an approval from the Monetary Authority of Singapore is significant, having a license. This enables them to conduct their business in what they believe to be a more thorough, thorough open, transparent manner. We look at this from a point of view of regulators in early days saying they're not sure it's probably a no to saying actually this is something we need to embrace and really drive forward and we've seen that with creation of different working groups for example the fintech innovation group here at the monetary authority of singapore they're now looking not just to embrace fintech but to drive the growth so looking to really push forward different products and services that benefit not only incumbent providers but new players and there's a bit of a divergence on whether you think that what's happening is designed to help one group or another and we'll come to that again in a moment mas has said they want to take a technology neutral approach in formulating rules in singapore now Again, depending on your point of view, this is or isn't the case. So some people think that the rules currently have been designed to help uh, current incumbents, some that they've been designed to help more than new players, and some that they're actually designed mostly to help regulators. It's always worth pointing out that regulators do tend to end up slightly behind the curve because they sometimes lack expertise in these areas. You know, the market can innovate much faster than often regulators can catch up with. We see here the new Bank Negara governor towards the end of last year saying that as financial services rules have changed, we need new regulatory mechanisms. We, we can't keep up with things that have been around for a number of years. We have to continually update. Bank Negara released a regulatory sandbox to look at genuinely innovative ideas. And that's an interesting phrase um, because they also talk about preserving consumer protection. And when we look at the way they phrase this uh, in a few moments sometimes it doesn't come across that they're looking for genuinely innovative ideas but actually looking to help the current incumbents shortly after this uh, Malaysia formed the FinTech Association of Malaysia which picked up straight away about 54 members and a number of associate members as well uh, looking to drive uh, development of the industry we also have uh, a FinTech consortium in Singapore and there's a number of different groups in various places forming uh, along similar lines with reference to the regulatory sandbox this is perceived differently depending on who we ask and we can see here from the fca it's designed to act as a safe space for firms to test new ideas without incurring all of the normal regulatory consequences enables financial institutions or any interested firms to experiment with innovative fintech solutions for the duration of the sandbox, MAS will relax specific regulatory requirements, which, which an applicant would otherwise be subject to. Now, there's interesting wording in this statement from MAS, as well as the statement from the Monetary Authority of Singapore. And it focuses on the fact that 
typically in, in most cases, regulatory sandboxes have been built or been opened up and they seem to be primarily aimed at financial institutions. Now, financial institutions in most cases are not the same as fintech providers. So we talked earlier about fintech providers being often small, scalable startups, so using software solutions, not hardware. And that's different from typical FIs, which begs the question amongst people that work in fintech and also for us on the regulatory side, who is this designed to benefit? This is a column that was on Forbes from a guy called Marcus Nurk, who uh, works for a fintech accelerator here in Singapore. And he says himself, consultation papers have been more or less focused on financial institutions. Hong Kong's Monetary Authority talks about authorized institutions, doesn't include emerging startups at all. Bank Nagara Malaysia gives priority to FIs and fintech companies that partner up. Applications by fintech companies have less priority. Now, surely the point of a sandbox is that fintech firms that have new, different, disruptive ideas and technologies can test them out in a safe manner. Why have them if the rules pertaining to them are specifically focused on financial institutions? It doesn't necessarily help those potentially disruptive companies. Now, as part of this article, Marcus also made the point that do we actually need regulatory sandboxes? FIs are able to test new products, maybe in partnership with fintech companies. He says they are the winners here. FIs get to test out products with lower regulatory requirements before they put them into market. They get a free pass for a 12-month period to give it a go and see if it works. Fintech companies, if you're a good fintech company, why would you create a product that doesn't conform to regulatory requirements? That doesn't make any sense. Good ones, he says, will get a license directly, as we've seen from companies like Fundnell. If you spend 12 months in a regulatory sandbox and you can't quite figure it out, figure it out then the chances are you won't he says that totally disruptive companies probably won't get accepted as the focus in most cases is on the existing regulatory framework now this was borne out in some respects last year with an announcement from the fca in the uk so in september they announced that they'd accepted 24 firms into their regulatory sandbox now there were 69 applications and that's considerably fewer than 50%. So it does beg the question again of who this is designed to benefit. Now regulators already also stand to gain here. For them, it's an excellent way of learning about those new technologies, seeing what's happening in the market and how they can adjust the framework and make better regulations. I mentioned previously that different people have a considerably different interpretation of this. Talking to a regulator last year in Malaysia, their view was that they didn't stand to benefit at all. Their view was that this was designed primarily for new startup disruptive fintech firms. Talking to fintech firms, they see this as something that's designed to benefit incumbent financial institutions. They think this is a bit difficult. They don't really see the point of it for them in many cases because they're already making products that conform to requirements. Talking to the banks and insurance firms, they see this as being a benefit to the fintech firms because they can have a go for 12 months and a bank wouldn't be able to do that. A standard FI it typically has to comply with those relevant requirements. So all three of those different elements have a very different view of who this benefits the most. And in some senses, that's problematic in itself. If everybody thinks this is a benefit somebody else, are people truly seeing the benefit of the sandbox? And I think at this point in time, it's hard to know. Only time will tell as we see more results come out of those sandboxes and see companies producing uh, good products. However, we've already got so many in the market that are regulated and are becoming regulated. Again, for, for a lot of people, that begs the question of do we really need this? And is this, is this more for show than for anything else? In October, uh, Malaysia, Bank Nagara Malaysia announced their regulatory sandbox and they announced a few key criteria. So the idea here to approve the accessibility, efficiency, security and quality of financial services. Again, this looks like it's aimed at typical FIs, not new disruptors. Enhance the efficiency and effectiveness of Malaysian financial institutions management of risks. Again, that's designed for incumbent providers. Address gaps in or open up new opportunities for financing or investments in the Malaysian economy. None of that particularly seems geared towards disruptive technologies. A lot of this looks like it's designed 
for current providers, current financial institutions to look at doing things in a different or better manner. There's not a lot of push here from what we can see towards really developing avenues for very, very different niche, unique products. The Monetary Authority of Singapore in November released their guidelines, and these were based on extensive consultation and feedback. And they gave very detailed elements in terms of what you needed to do to comply. But I think what's more interesting here is something they announced in tandem with this, and that was granting significant amounts of funding for fintech companies doing trials, up to $200,000. Now, this is a, a distinguishing factor from both Hong Kong and Malaysia in terms of the levels of funding that have been offered. So uh, at the FinTech Festival, awards were given up to one and a half million dollars worth for companies. And there was also a sort of innovation group, a sort of lab set up for a lot of firms to continue developing their product with other supervision and help. MAS will fund 50% of the costs of these trials capped at that $200,000. Should not just be about jobs being replaced and new jobs being created, but about transformation of existing jobs. So Singapore and MAS as well are very worried about the idea of technology replacing people. The idea is that we want jobs to remain, but be different, use new capabilities and different skills. MAS have 100 fintech mentors and 100 internships excuse me, secured for this year. And two and a half thousand students in banking and IT related polytechnic courses expected to benefit. So they have signed up with all five local polytechnics to offer uh, elements of training and knowledge for both fintech and now regtech as well. So this is, again, a sea change. We're looking at this from a student perspective. What will this mean for the future? Not just what can we get now for people moving forward. The FinTech Festival went off, as you can see, a, a bit like a rock show here. Uh, and it did end with a rock concert, I should point out. Um, and this was an absolutely massive event uh, in terms of uh, events that we would see around the region, uh, attracting around 11,000 people. Uh, this also, the dates have been penciled in already for this to take place again in November of this year. All of this good news, of course, does come with some criticism at times. And something we saw towards the end of last year was, particularly with a view on Asia, the idea of there being so many innovation labs, and um, we saw towards the end of last year, the first innovation lab in Singapore is closing down. And they've been around for nearly five years, and they've said they've sort of done what they needed to do. There isn't any new development or growth now, and so they're, they're exiting. And this graphic, I think, is particularly interesting. If you look at the comparison of what happens in Asia with the US and UK, and it's in some senses a little bit sad to say, but this does ring true. Asia has lots of conferences, we have awards, we have events everywhere, we've got the sandboxes, lots of accelerators, lots of incubation labs, an enormous amount of press, and this goes around in a circle. And it's hard to tell often what's being achieved. What, what am I getting better as a consumer? And if I look at what I'm able to access now as an individual, it's no different from it was a year ago. Where is all this benefit? Whereas in the US and in parts of Europe, we're looking more towards things like the APIs, different licenses for fintech requirements, actual deals, so people using this in a real sense, and then businesses exiting, so partnering up or being bought out by bigger companies and rolling that technology into bigger solutions. Now, of course, we, we hope that this situation will change and the view will improve as time goes by, but at the moment, there is, there is a feeling that this is really what is happening in, in lots of cases. I mentioned the FinTech Festival briefly, and you can see here some detail. 50 countries, 70 plus exhibitors at the conference, and 11,000 people through the week, so absolutely enormous. Um, and this is from Fin News Asia, the quote at the bottom. The reviews were mixed. Many saying that Hong Kong event had been less structured, seemed to have been put together in a hurry. Now, as part of that event, there was also a, a sort of FinTech forum and a RegTech forum hosted by the Securities and Futures Commission in Hong Kong, with some interesting speeches given by Ashley Alder and Benedict De Nolan. So if you get a chance to look at the, the SFC website, it's worth looking up those speeches in terms of what it means for the industry and what they're planning to do. We've also seen a, a growth over really the last year and a half, particularly over the last 12 months for RegTech. Again, depending on who you ask, RegTech is viewed very differently. Now, if you ask a regulator, RegTech is designed exclusively to benefit financial services firms. 
I would fundamentally disagree with that. I think regulatory technology, and we see here that's the use of new technology to facilitate delivery of regulatory requirements, can be extended and expanded to any industry that has regulatory requirements. So, for example, pharmaceuticals or medical devices, aviation, manufacturing. If we can provide systems that benefit and enhance our ability to comply with regulations in those systems that has no interaction with financial technology or financial institutions. So for me, RegTech, much, much broader, but has really sprung up as something linked to financial services firms because by and large, they have the largest plethora of requirements, laws and regulations to deal with. This is from about a year ago from Deloitte, a very interesting white paper they published is RegTech, the new fintech. Technology that seeks to provide nimble, configurable, easy to integrate, reliable, secure, and cost-effective regulatory solutions. Now, again, I would argue that RegTech is not the new FinTech. I think they are completely separate things. If you are a RegTech provider, you don't have to have any interaction with FinTech at all. So I, I look at these as being different areas, although they, they consistently get branded and branched under a, a similar point of view. The idea here is we want to make things easier, swifter, more complete and efficient to monitor compliance and regulatory obligations. Again, you could look at this from the point of view of, for example, a mining organization who have myriad regulations to require by, to require, to adhere to, sorry, and nothing involving finance. The idea here is to make things more efficient and scalable to drive down the cost of being in compliance. Typically, these will be cloud based solutions that focus on software and not hardware. Gone are the days where we have to go in and install something on company servers that might take six months and then get people up to speed with another six months of training. Things can be rolled out, can be amended, can be molded to suit a company in a matter of hours in some cases, but typically days. Some of the benefits here that it provides is the ability to innovate whilst we enhance consumer confidence and make things better for people and for organizations, enhance the customer experience. And if we can provide a better experience for customers, there's a good chance that we'll keep them on. Keeping information secure, we've seen an endless amount of data breaches. Uh, and again, that I don't think is likely to change, but how can we as a customer, as a consumer, have comfort that what we provide to an organization is being well looked after? We want to protect the financial health of institutions or know when there's chance of disruption or risk. So if we can predict in a better way issues arising, we have a better chance of preventing them. Looking at improving governance with transparency, proactive reporting of risks and compliance. I've seen some fantastic RegTech solutions out there to really streamline things like production of compliance policy and manuals, things like reporting to the board. You know, board solutions are sort of all over the place now and there's a lot that we can do that's automated that really improves these things. Again, early adopters get to set the trends. Often what we see is not the earliest adopter, but the second or third in line that actually gets a lot of the benefits. They can pick up some of the issues that the very earliest adopters had and seek to mitigate against those. We've now also seen things like this happening. So we've got Planet Compliance in, uh, actually I think at the end of December, early January, released the RegTech directory. So they released a document that has uh, hundreds of RegTech companies listed, where they're based, what they do, and what benefit they provide. So it's an easy way of finding out the companies that are out there. Now, of course, they, they don't list every single company out there. It'd be very hard to find them all, but they've done a pretty good job of listing as many as they can. And this is free to download on their website. So if you are looking for solutions, this is a great place to go to try and find out what's there. We've also seen, as is typical, bigger companies coming in and looking at solutions and how they can incorporate those into things that ex already exist. This is from September of last year. This is IBM buying a company called Promontory, a financial consulting firm. Excellent organization, very, very good in terms of regulatory compliance consulting, and IBM bought that organization. The idea is that they're planning to roll in the knowledge and intelligence, the skills from the Promontory group, from their 600 plus consultants, into the Watson system. Now their Watson artificial intelligence system is very well regarded as being a sort of world leading AI tool. And the idea is to roll this knowledge in, which could then be delivered to financial services firms to improve their regulatory compliance. So they're reporting uh, the time taken to do specific jobs. 
will this work? And again, only time will tell. But what we've seen in the last week is news like this. And this is from Australia. So IBM has been actively going out, speaking to organizations in Australia, uh, amongst other places, trying to get them to sign up for this. So they've said, and they've been going out um, and saying that currently no Australian bank is using Watson. Some clients are actively engaging with us to assess the contribution Watson, Watson can make. Others are less advanced in the dialogue. So they're actively out there trying to get banks to sign up to use this. Now, again, this may serve an excellent purpose to streamline some of those regulatory compliance requirements. It may also make the need to have lots of people lower. So this could provide a potential cost saving over a period of time for organizations, but it may end up uh, reducing the number of staff needed to carry out these roles in the future. We've also seen organizations, and I mentioned Goldman Sachs earlier, um, investing in firms. These are significant sums. And this is from November uh, of last year. Uh, prop trading, Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, a prop trading firm, investing in Droit Financial Technologies. So this is designed to ensure regulatory compliance with transactions, automation of trading decisions. So 16 million for a, a reg tech firm is a significant amount of money in this day and age. Uh, and I think this is quite significant that we're seeing this happen much more now on the reg tech side, um, as well as on that fintech side. So we can really see that people, if Goldman Sachs and Wells Fargo are doing it, we can see that firms think there's a benefit to doing this. There's also a movement now to form collaboration groups. So one, for example, is the International Regulatory Technology Association. And this is currently a group on LinkedIn with more formal news to come out, I believe, in February. And this is a place for people to get together, share information on RegTech. And there are other groups as well. There's another one here in Singapore uh, and in various other locations. And, and a lot of these are out there and they have forum, forums on places like LinkedIn, but also there are specific associations or consortiums in places like Australia, in Singapore, in Malaysia, and in Hong Kong. So people can share ideas and information. Now we've come to the end of the content we had lined up for today. And I realize that we've covered an awful lot of ground. So I'm happy to take questions. I'm available to stay on the line for a number of minutes. Um, and I've, I've left my contact details here on purpose because I'm more than happy to receive uh, requests from you separately. If you'd like to send me an email or drop me a line, I'm happy to respond uh, as is necessary to people to provide as much information as we can that might be of use to you. Uh, or we can receive questions now. So if anyone has anything, feel free to, to send a question through. If not, in a few minutes, we um, will sign off and let you get back to what I'm sure has been a very busy January before for a lot of you, the Chinese New Year period. And for those of you uh, in Australia, the, uh, the Australia Day celebrations. If there are no questions, uh, please feel free to, to jump off the webinar. I hope you found that useful and, uh, and something that was uh, new for you. Uh, please feel free to contact us should there be any questions. And here at GRC Solutions, we look forward to engaging with you again uh, as soon as we can. Uh, for everyone that's on the call, happy Chinese New Year, Gong Si Fa Chai. Happy Australia Day for our friends down under. Um, and we wish you all the best for 2017. I just received a question. Um, where do you see fintech playing out in the financial inclusion space? And uh, if you're still on the line, um, I think this is uh, I think this is one of its uh, potentially greatest avenues. Um, and from a from a sort of altruistic point of view, it's where 
I would really like to see fintech develop in, in the sense of helping those um, who haven't got inclusion in the unbanked. I think things like um, wave money that we mentioned from from Myanmar. I think there's another fascinating case uh, in Indonesia, which is uh, a group called Wang Tiaman, uh, and I'm happy to provide information to you uh, on this because we use this as a case study as well um, uh, of setting up financial solutions, so fintech solutions, to people that previously would not have had access to to these types of products and services. Um, and I think the use of things like simple mobile technology, where people don't have PCs, don't have smartphones, don't have good internet connection, is invaluable in terms of uh, aiding financial inclusion. There is actually a financial inclusion summit happening here in April in Singapore, um, if, you're, if you do have to be based here and interested. Um, and I think this is one of its its biggest reaches. I mean, with things like the equity crowdfunding, I think they're they're good, but a lot of it, a lot of things that are funded are quite gimmicky. And there's been a huge amount that have not worked out. I think peer-to-peer lending is the same. I think it's pretty high risk. Um, it's not something I think most people really should be getting into. Whereas I think providing fintech products for those people, the unbanked, as they were referred to earlier. I mean, that's really what we should be doing, you know, providing basic finance solutions to those who need it most, as opposed to providing complex solutions to people that just ends up leading them down a, a dark alley.